taking the time to join me. So how might we represent data in ways that provides value and insights to anyone, regardless of their abilities? How might we create accessible data experiences that truly meet people where they're at? These are some questions that have been top of mind for my working group that is striving to make data accessible through all of our charts, graphs, and visualizations. And this is really important because DataViz is prominently featured in a lot of our products. For example, for people using our search or news properties, we use visualizations to help them quickly find answers to questions they're asking of those products. And for those who use our consumer hardware devices, whether it's a mobile device or a wearable, it's more than likely that they're using DataViz to track things like their daily activity, their fitness, and even monitoring chronic health conditions. And even for our enterprise customers, we use visualizations to help them make better, more well-informed business decisions. And this has worked really well, because if you think about what DataViz does, is it really taps into the human vision system and it leverages our ability to pre-attentively process information that's presented by the environment around us. And through this capability, we're almost instantly and subconsciously able to spot trends, patterns, and outliers in all of the images that we see. So if we look at this example, I think it's very clear that there's three distinct visual patterns just jumping off of this screen. We have one on the left that's defined by the size of the shape. We have one in the middle that's defined by the use of fills versus borders. And then we have one out on the right that's defined by the type of shape, circles and triangles. Now, if you start to think about these different elements or characteristics, if you will, uh, size, borders, fills, shape type, these are all examples of visual variables or visual encodings. And these attributes or characteristics, if you will, are essentially the building blocks to all visualizations. And of course, when you start to think about that thought process, uh, this is how we're able to use visual encodings and tap into the human vision system to make visualizations glanceable, um, enabling us to process them a lot of times faster than we can process text. So that's all well and good. And if we look at this visualization, um, this was something that we created during the pandemic to help people understand the geographical distribution of COVID-19 cases. I think we can all agree that this is fairly glanceable and it provides a lot of just instantly viewable insights. Now, while that experience might work for a lot of us, for some of us, this is going to be the experience. For others, this might be how they experience the visualization. And for folks who are blind, this is going to be the experience. Now, in all of these examples I just shared, we're starting to miss out on all of those, all of the value, uh, the insights, this glanceability, these details provided by the visualization to someone who can see it in its entirety. So in America, we know that according to stackexchange.com, over 4 million people rely on assistive technology to consume web content. But we also know that there are millions of other people who are not using assistive technology, trying to view these visualizations and interpret them. For example, we know that about 300 million people worldwide have color deficient vision or color blindness. And there are plenty of other um, vision disabilities out there we need to consider. So when you look at these numbers, we're actually looking at the order of millions to hundreds of millions of people we need to consider when we're crafting um, data experiences. And it's important that we think about accessibility here because we wanna ensure that folks really have a seat at the table and they're able to consume the information that we're creating. So about two, maybe two and a half years ago at this point, um, I co-founded a working group inside of Google that has been striving to make data accessible um, to, to different groups around the world. And uh, today I'm gonna to share a few lessons that we learned on that journey. And right out of the gate, I'm just gonna share the first lesson that this is really difficult. So it's easy to make an experience accessible if you're looking at it from a compliance standpoint. But accessibility becomes increasingly more difficult if you're trying to make something that's actually useful. 
Then if you think about the other end of the discipline, data visualization, that can also be very difficult to do well, at least in terms of making something that's actually useful. And when you start to combine those two disciplines, data visualization and accessibility into data accessibility, you really feel like facing this tangled, gnarly mess of a design challenge. So right out of the gate, this is, this is really difficult. So I wanna share a few lessons learned along the way as um, you know, we've been researching this topic over the past few years. And first, I want to focus on those hundreds of millions of people that we should consider that are not using assistive technology. And there's some really interesting visual design challenges that come up here. So let's take a look at this example. This is a digital well-being chart. And I think we can all agree that the color palette here is very calm. It's cool. It's collected. It probably fits within this theme of well-being. Kind of feels a little zen. But the fact of the matter is, for somebody who has a protonopia condition, this is how they're going to experience this chart. And you'll notice the top two categories, other and uh, the YouTube category, uh, denoted by the, the top two segments in this donut chart, are nearly indistinguishable from one another. So now this is a bit more difficult to read. And for folks who can't see any color, uh, this is going to be the experience. And in my humble opinion, this is just a waste of screen real estate because this chart is no longer readable. Uh, so get the data table back uh, because this is this is pretty much useless uh, to experience it this way. So, so what do we do? Um, a lot of times we start with web standards. And if we look at WCAG standards or web content accessibility guidelines, uh, they call for this need to meet uh, color contrast criteria. And what I mean by that is each color needs to achieve a minimum of a three to one contrast ratio with its neighboring color. And this is this is graphical color. So all the, the data ink that you would imagine in the chart. If we're looking at text, that contrast ratio bumps up to a 4.5 to one. So when thinking about these recommended ratios and the standards, um, this is an example of a palette that would achieve that. And I think we can all agree it's, it's nice and, and bold. And when applied to a chart, it might look like this. Now, there's something interesting about this because if I were to tell you that the most important metric in this chart is represented by the red segments that run along the bottom of each stacked bar in this series, I think we can all agree that it's actually kind of difficult to, to see that because now we have three colors that are very bold following these accessibility standards that are equally competing for our attention. So one thing that we started to learn along the way was to use color contrast in a way that still enables you to read all the elements in the chart, but draw focus to what matters. So we're gonna do a little bit of an experiment and maybe you could even consider this a little bit of a magic trick here. But we're going to use outlines instead of fills um, for some of the upper bars where the outlines achieve the contrast ratio, but then the fills are a bit lighter. And now you'll notice um, our attention is actually brought down to the metrics that matter most in this visualization. This is something that would still pass um, an accessibility audit. So this was kind of an interesting trick that we had learned early on that we started sharing with, with feature teams across Google uh, because we felt it was really important to still draw focus to what matters yet stay accessible. So this is right out of the gate, a lesson learned that uh, we found very useful using a combination of fills and borders to focus on the metrics that matter most. So let's go back to our donut chart here, and we're going to upgrade this. And OK, now, color contrast is better. We even use this combination of borders and fills just to kind of even out the, the focus and focal points of this particular donut chart. Now, there's still an accessibility problem here. And that is because color is our only encoding. And what I mean by that is it's our only way of connecting uh, segments in the donut chart to the corresponding legend items. So you still need to be able to read and interpret colors to do this. So another requirement is to think of using a dual encoding or something other than color to convey the same meaning. So a lot of times as designers, we just want to jump in and, hey, we'll, we'll add patterns to the visualization. And we might end up with something that looks like this. Now, we have to ask ourselves, in this particular example, is this still a glanceable visualization? There's a lot of visual vibration here. Yes, it, it checks all of the compliance boxes, but is this something that is still glanceable? Is it readable? Is it useful? And I think the answer to this is, is no, we can do a bit better. So this 
starts to bring up the question, and I think Edward Tufte, those of you who like his work, might uh, this might ring a bell. Uh, how might we make charts accessible, but yet minimize chart junk, minimize that noise, those those textures that are just kind of like, you know, decreasing the chart's readability? So I'm going to share a few tricks that we've learned along the way here, and I'm going to start with the legend. Let's ditch the legend, and we can use text as our dual encoding, and just bring that in line with the visualization. So in this particular example, it works, but a lot of times we don't have the luxury of having the screen real estate to do something like this. And depending on the shape of the data, it also might be more difficult to do this as well. So we might be able to use something like iconography to represent categories here, and you can connect the diamond and the dot to the corresponding regions and countries in this particular legend. In this particular case, we've also leaned into this idea of using borders and fills on the stacked uh, area chart to also draw focus. And of course, if there's a metric that might matter a bit more to a viewer here, uh, we can paint that with a darker fill color. Now, some charts have a lot of categorical um, comparisons going on, or a lot of categories. So I think we've all seen this tangled mess of a line chart example on the left. So we might have worked with uh, some engineering teams who asked us to just cram as many categories into a visualization as possible. And in this case, it's, it starts to get really difficult to be able to, to pull out the, um, the comparisons between these categories. So in this case, it's nice to kind of just go back to the basics and think of how might we just redo this entire chart, in this case, breaking it out onto spark lines, where now we no longer have to rely on color, the spark line example being on the right here. And arguably, for someone who is fully sighted, you can actually read the individual trends um, a lot more effectively. And from an accessibility standpoint, we no longer have to rely on dual encodings because we don't rely on color to convey meaning. And we can also apply text to each of the individual rows in this example. We've also thought a lot about just representing status in our tables. And something that we learned with working uh, with people who are colorblind, especially folks who are red-green colorblind, is that it's easier to think about how might we use um, a combination of borders and fills to draw focus to what matters in a table? So that way, someone who can't differentiate between the red and green colors here can scan the table for the fills and actually find the items that matter most or might be in some sort of error state. And then, of course, we started thinking about how might we make some of these metaphors a bit more relatable? Uh, so. In Fitbit, we actually just launched um, an update to our app, and we thought a bit about accessibility here. And we thought about ways in which we can make the data a bit more relatable. So for example, we have these different activity zones that you can see. And the way that we represented them is with dotted lines. And we played with the spacing between each of those threshold lines, the dots within those lines. And you'll notice that there's actually a visual rhythm here. And since we're showing heart zones, the higher the heart rate zone or higher your heart rate goes, you'll notice the threshold lines are closer together so that it almost implies that there's this kind of vibration going on that matches the rhythm of a faster beating heart the higher that you go. Now, sometimes, you know, the way that we think about this isn't as straightforward. These are really difficult challenges, especially to do well. And um, <clears throat> we've taken inspiration from areas outside of design that really influence the way we think about this. So for example, we look to nature to think about how we might create a better visualization that shows weather patterns um, in the atmosphere. We also look to printing processes, like halftone printing processes, to think about how we might make a more accessible heat map with a dual encoding. And we also look to areas like architecture and how people move through a space or a building to inspire how we might create a better progress indicator, in this case, using animation to show that this chart is actually filling up to 100% rather than draining down to zero and also giving us the, a sense of the full scope of this visualization, even when it's empty. So what we found in all of these examples is that it's much easier to think about accessibility first rather than trying to retrofit it to an existing chart because that's when we found ourselves going down this path of adding unnecessary chart junk. So think about the standards first. They're very challenging to work with, but in doing that, I promise you, it can lead you down a better path. And we found ways in which we were combining really interesting chart types to create new and novel data experiences that not only meet the standards, but for someone who is fully sighted, for example, 
um, these methods and, and designs that we were coming up with, we felt really actually leveraged those core pre-attentive processing capabilities I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. All right, so I talked a lot about visual design here and, and how to make something that's glanceable and useful, yet still accessible and works for people with vision disabilities. And I, I dwelled on this because it's, it's really hard to do this, and it's something that takes a lot of advocacy within your organization, and it, sometimes it takes a little bit to get people on board with that too. So I cannot stress the importance of just thinking about these things up front when crafting these accessible data experiences. All right, now let's switch gears. Let's talk about um, designing for folks who use assistive technology and some lessons we learned along the way there. And first and foremost, and I alluded to this in the previous example, but it's really important here as well, is to build a diverse team and, and really work with people um, with um, an array of disabilities and people who use um, assistive technology as part of their daily lives. Uh, once we started doing this, it really just kind of changed the way in which we thought about a lot of these uh, data viz challenges. So I'm going to name a few here. And the first is how might we structure a chart so that's easy to navigate with a keyboard. Now, this is going to be useful for people who are using assistive technology and especially uh, folks who have uh, limited uh, mobility and motor skills. And I want to look at this example. This is a network graph that was offered by LinkedIn a few years ago. And it was part of a, visualiz a visualization tool that enabled you to visualize your, your LinkedIn connections and your network and, and how they're connected to one another. And I want to do a bit of a thought experiment here. I want to ask you, how might we navigate or how might we design a, a keyboard navigation experience for a visualization like this? And I, I think the first thing that might come to mind as well, you could just tab through each of the nodes and learn a bit more about how those nodes are connected to one another. Now, if we stop and think about a LinkedIn network, some people may have hundreds of connections. You might have some folks who have thousands of connections. And you might even have some influencers that have tens of thousands of connections. Now, if you think about the experience, we have to ask ourselves as, uh, as designers, is it responsible of us to require our users to tab through 10,000 nodes in a visualization only if they're trying to interact with something that might appear after this visualization on the web page? I think the answer to this is a resounding no. So what are some alternative methods that we could use here? Well, we could think about this a bit more hierarchically. So for example, you'll notice that some of these nodes are color-coded. And uh, those color codings actually represent different social circles within this person's network. And these could be people that might have worked for the same company. It could have been people who belong to um, a trade group or an organization, or maybe people who attend UX talks. Uh, it could be, uh, for example, folks who go to maybe attended the same school or university. So it could be that we think about this a bit more hierarchically. And perhaps maybe you can tab to the graph and then tab through each of the different uh, circles within the graph or subnetworks, and then select one of those groups and then navigate through um, the individuals that are part of that group. Um, another ex way we could think about this is maybe using alternative keys like arrows. So perhaps we could flatten out the navigation. And when you tab to the chart, you can select it and then just arrow through the different nodes um, or people uh, in an on-demand sort of basis as you wish and, and explore the visualization. And if we think about, you know, what, is the, what does a network graph do really well? A lot of times it enables you to locate the most uh, influential nodes, or in this case, people in the network. So maybe we could employ sh uh, keyboard shortcuts and uh, that only take you to um, people who are influencers or navigate to those more connected nodes on this particular uh, visualization. So I threw out three options here and we're not gonna profess to solve this today, but the idea is that how we would solve it is we do it in a way that gets back to the core use case of this visualization. How do we set up the navigation so we can enable people to quickly explore the data, and even um, quick, more quickly find answers to questions uh, they're asking of that data? So a couple of things we learned along the way here is using alternative keys um, to help people find answers to those questions um, the quickest method possible they're asking of the visualization. And we thought a lot about this in um, Google Cloud and some of our dashboards. You can see um, we synchronized the navigation um, across this and, and 
um, using alternative keys like arrows in this case, uh, we can navigate through different metrics in our dashboards. So let's talk about text and how might we use text to prioritize uh, data exploration and, and surface insights. And this is gonna be very useful for someone who can't see a visualization at all. It's almost like using text to create a glanceable view of the data. And this world of AI that we live in could be very useful here. So I, I wanna um, provide some thoughts on this along the way too, because this could be a useful tool when it comes to data accessibility moving forward. Now, when we think about how to do this, it's easy to just want to fall into the trap of saying, you know what, let's just summarize the, the visualization. But that might work in some cases, but in other cases, we don't want to introduce unintended bias into the experience. So again, we have to think about the use case of the visualization. For example, some charts and graphs were created for an analyst who might be doing an investigation or um, a root cause analysis on a particular problem. And in this case, the visualization might not directly answer questions, but it's going to unlock the right set of follow-up questions to ask along the way. And if you think about the role that um, AI might play here is perhaps we can prompt people to further explore the data. And if we use text, we can use it in a way that prioritizes data exploration. Other visualizations are a bit more utilitarian in their uh, focus and use case. And I always like to think of this idea of a stock chart. And as a designer of a visualization like this, a lot of times we're confident in the questions people are asking of this data. If you think about the last time you checked a stock quote, you were probably interested in the value of that stock. Was it higher or lower than the previous time you checked it? And what is its performance trend looking like? And in these cases, we could likely start to think about those insights because we already know what's interesting to a user here. So we can, we can use text to share some of those insights, like unexpected spikes or dips in the, um, the stock's performance over the designated time frame. And then finally, there are other visualizations that are a bit more editorial in nature. And a lot of times, these are those charts or graphs that you'd see in an executive summary or a sales presentation or maybe even a news article. And a lot of times, these are used to cite evidence provided by the overarching narrative. And in these cases, because we are strengthening a case that's already made, um, we could typically highlight those takeaways front and center and using text actually probably summarize uh, what the takeaway is from the visualization. So I think it's important to just think about these array of use cases here and how um, we can use text to really enhance the experience because that's gonna really be helpful for someone who can't see it at all. And now we're giving them access to the information that unlocking that value and those insights provided by the visualization to someone um, who can see it in its entirety. All right, so I talked a lot about text. Hopefully this provoked some thoughts here. Uh, let's talk about the screen reader uh, experience a bit more and how might we create a useful screen reader experience. And one thing that we learned here, and this is working with people who are blind. Um, in fact, uh, they were part of our design process and we co-designed a lot of these solutions with, with them. One thing we learned is it's important to always orient people in the data. So if the navigation experience is hierarchical at each level of that exploration, just always provide an overview of what's happening. Let people know where they came from, where they are, and where they can expect to, to go, and give them a sense of what's happening at that particular level. And that's really important, that extra context and helping someone understand the data set. Um, with the same team, we also learned that a lot of folks who use assistive technology are actually quite proficient in navigating a data table and extracting their own insights from it. Now, we're not saying that, hey, just give access to the data and call it a day. Um, but what we are suggesting here is in some cases, this could be a viable option. And of course, it's always responsible to, uh, to you know, cite your sources and give access to the uh, underlying data anyway, just to build transparency. So in this case, if you have an accessibility testing program in place or have access to one, I would say test it because this could be a viable option. So the last thing I want to share uh, around just actual lessons learned with uh, charting in our group is how might we leverage other senses when representing data? And something that comes to mind here is this idea of data stunning.
And data sonification, as you could see by that demo, is using sound to represent data. And what you might have noticed as you were listening to that series is that when the trend line spiked, uh, you could hear a noticeable change in the sound. And uh, this, this was an experiment in enabling people to listen to data and something that's kind of catching fire across the industry. So that was an example of it in a chart. But data sonification really isn't anything that, that's very new to us. In fact, it's something that's part of our everyday lives. So for example, in America, an ADA compliant elevator, a lot of times we'll use data sonification. And if you've taken an elevator and um, right before the doors open, you might have heard a chime. Uh, one chime typically means the elevator is traveling upwards, and two chimes means the elevator is typically traveling downward. This is an example of, of an everyday use of that. You don't even have to have an assistive technology experience to access that. It's just part of everyone's experience. So something we learned in thinking about our experiments with sonification that actually are available in our, in our line chart, GCP, to, um, through our assistive technology experience, and thinking about how sonification is applied to daily life, is how, how can it just be part of the core experience? something that everyone experiences. So now we don't only have to see the data, but we have a way of listening to it as well. All right, so these are some lessons that we've learned over the past two years as we've been working with teams across Google. But I want to talk about making it happen, uh, because it can be really difficult to get folks on board um, with, with making a case for accessibility. And these are hard challenges to solve that require time and, and engineering capacity and uh, collaboration time with groups, it, it can be expensive. Well, there is a business case for this. And we know, according to Annie Jean Baptiste's book in 2017, there was, a, as of that point in time, there was a $1 trillion market uh, for consumers with disabilities. We also know that charts, graphs, and visualizations will block an accessibility audit. And as I started to work on this and join the team early on, this was something that I learned very quickly. And as we start to think about the European Accessibility Act, and some of the ways um, accessibility is enforced uh, from a liability standpoint, this becomes really important and starts to become easy to make this case uh, for accessibility. Uh, so here at Google, we started a working group. Um, we realized that there was a, a need for this type of thinking. And historically, we were always making our, our products accessible. Compliance was really important to us. But the spirit of this group is how do we transcend compliance and make something that's actually useful? So we formed our working group uh, with some teams across Google because we knew this was on the minds of other designers and engineers in the organization. Uh, we started the Data Accessibility Working Group, which we so lovingly refer to as DOG. And during that time, uh, we were able to start to solve some of these problems. Now, I want to share some lessons learned here because this is more about community building. So if there's a cause that you're working on or something you believe in or something you might want to explore more that could benefit your customers in a, in a meaningful or impactful way, uh, I'm going to share some lessons learned in forming a community internally that can enable you to forward your thinking and advance your ideas. So our accessibility working group, the idea was that we would get everyone together. We would see what problems were already solved, learn from each other, so then we wouldn't spend our limited time and resources solving problems that were already solved or reinventing the wheel, so to speak. We could focus our time on those challenges, those unanswered questions that um, we still needed to work on. In doing this, we noticed that we were starting to collect a lot of information that was useful to other people in the organization. And we, we were starting to build the collection up enough to the point where we had something to share with others. So how do you get to this point of publishing a website or publishing something, especially that might not be part of your core day job? And how do you encourage other people to participate? So first, we had to think about that, that loop of learning from each other and how we can get people to engage with that. And yes, we did a lot of guest presentations, but you know that's only one way communication. So it's important to really think about how do we encourage others to contribute and have more of an open two-way discussion about it. And we did that through design reviews and setting aside time for brainstorming time as well. We found that that really energized the group. So that combination of presentations, reviews, brainstorming time, and discussions um, was, was very energizing uh, for folks who are joining us. Now, through that process, we were able to de um, really determine who our champions were, the people that were so eager that they really wanted to to take the extra time and go the extra mile to contribute to something like our website that we were going to publish. So 
through that process, we were able to identify that, that working group that would then um, be the folks that would actually contribute content to our website. And we've done this for a few cycles now. And I've noticed that it was just a really great way to engage people, get them excited, and kind of go beyond their day job to really publish something meaningful that others could benefit from. And we published our own internal specs and guidelines around this. We actually also um, published some of our work externally. So last year in the material design blog, um, you'll notice that there's an article for creating accessible visualizations. At this point, you might have to scroll down a little bit in the homepage to get to it because there's been some other content added. Um, but you can see some of our core guiding principles in this area. So I'm going to share a quick note about process, too. Along this whole way, uh, we spent a lot of time co-designing solutions and rapid prototyping. So we worked with folks who have disabilities. We learned a lot in testing with them and, and engaging them and um, inviting them into our design process. Um, but then the core team also um, went off and we were doing our like paper prototyping and, and rapid prototyping. We spent a lot of time at whiteboards because these are some really difficult challenges to solve. And um, I just want to share, you know, in design sprints, it was really important that our engineers were engaged with us, our product management partners, and uh, our other um, accessibility analysts and subject matter experts and design colleagues. So drawing ended up being one of the main kind of mechanisms for communication that, uh, that we used throughout our processes. And it actually inspired me to write the book that George mentioned earlier on, Drawing Product Ideas. So just wanted to highlight that because this is um, an example of how drawing was used to solve a very important problem and um, make data accessible to a larger audience. So I wanted to share a little bit more about the book um, because it highlights some of the methods used to get to some of the solutions and, and lessons learned that I discussed today. So I'm going to leave you with a parting thought. Uh, as you start to think about you know, some of these lessons learned and how we might apply it in our day-to-day -day lives, I want you to think about the devices that you're designing for, the capabilities that they ship with. How might we create a visual design that works for people with, um, who are fully sighted, but also for with people with vision disabilities? How can we leverage other device capabilities like audio feedback and haptic feedback so that you can not only see data, but listen to data and even feel data? And how can we think about AI and using text to provide a glanceable overview of what's happening with the data, highlighting correlations and showing what's interesting? And if we start to think about those things a bit holistically and create these multi-sensory data experiences, I'm really confident that together we'll start to make a lot of progress in answering that question I initially posed at the beginning of the talk. How might we create accessible data experiences that truly meet people where they are? So thank you very much. This was a pleasure to be here. I uh, just want to give a shout out to all the folks who, uh, my colleagues and experts that provided um, you know, thoughts on this and, and contributed to a lot of the ideas shared today. I'm lucky enough to be here to present it, but really it, it took a lot of people to, uh, to bring this to fruition. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, also, if you like this talk, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, pretty active on LinkedIn these days, and you can also reach me directly if you'd like to continue this discussion a bit more. And then finally, I'm just going to flash up those uh, lessons learned that I shared throughout the presentation on one slide. So if you want to grab a screenshot of this or uh, snap a quick photo of it, um, you kind of have everything, all the takeaways in one slide here. So thanks again. This was awesome to be here. And uh, let's open up the floor for questions and feedback from folks in the group. Thanks so much, Kent. That was great. It was really, really interesting. Um, I have a few questions myself, but I'll, I'll leave this open to other people. If you want to feel free to unmute if you have a question for Kent, or just put it on chat, whichever you're more comfortable with. I'll just leave a pause for it. I'll start with one of my questions then. <laughs> yeah, hit me with it, George. Um, so I was I was wondering, first of all, I'd be interested about in hearing about how you tested these uh, data visualization ideas, especially with the different uh, like groups of people you would need to test with them with, and so how you approach that and process, I guess. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So there was um, 
a lot of times we were we were testing with with people um, using a screen reader or assistive technology for for some of the uh, latter parts of the the presentation. Um, the best part was because um, a lot of the folks were a core member of our team. It was easy to just rapidly test and do rapid research with them. So a lot of times, what we would do is we we get a prototype together. We had a, a very dedicated eng team um, who was very proficient at building at building prototypes. Uh, we'd get something in the code pretty quickly. It could be low fidelity, um, but at least you know the screen reader announcements were there. The basic assistive technology experience was there, and then we'd test it. And it was interesting because one of the first times we ran a test, we learned very quickly. Um, the the person who was uh, the participant basically said, "Hey." Um, I have no context for this visualization. I know where to navigate, but like, what, what is this? What is this visualization even about? And and very quickly, it was like, oh my gosh, we we never provided a text overview that provides the context around what we're actually like looking or communicating here. Uh, so basically, that was kind of like a first step. We added that, and then okay, now this person could get into the experience and have the context. And then we just kind of like worked through the end to end experience, um, improving it along along the way. So we would basically test one day, we'd go huddle as a team, sketch out a few ideas, get them in the code pretty quickly, and then by the end of the week, running a new test. And through that process, I would say it took about uh, a few months, we were able to start really kind of fine tuning how we were communicating this information in that experience. But that was really helpful because a lot of the feedback that we got along the way, then as we started making more visualizations, we were actually in the, in the business of running a component library. Um, we already kind of knew what to, how to handle it, and then the, the testing became easier. But every time we did it, we learned something new. So it was, it was kind of very, very iterative and, and very rapid. And then once we got it to a good point, then we realized, okay, like we have our own internal accessibility audits. We could put it through that formal process, or if we were working with a team that was going for a VPAT, um, trying to publish it, or an accessibility audit, um, it would be ready for that review, and we could feel confident it was going to pass it. Yeah, that's really, I hadn't really considered actually that you would need to do like a prototype that works on, a, if you need to do a prototype that works on a screen reader, it's got, it can't just be like yeah. a, a Figma prototype or it's got to be coded up to some degree. Yeah, and, and like, I think you can, you know, Figma's, Figma's great. I know as designers, it's a tool that's really popular uh, with data viz. I mean, even, even just building visualizations, I think it's important to start with the actual data that you're going to be using, or if you have a pretty accurate representation of it, and and start prototyping as soon as possible. Because even there, you'll see kind of like the edge cases. You'll understand like um, the shape of the data that you're working with, and it will inform some of the design decisions you're making along the way. And if you're treating accessibility as a first class citizen, uh, which we all should be, we'll start. You could use the screen reader experience or assisted technology and see how it kind of works with that too, and and tweak it as you go. Yeah, I think the 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 point you made as well about the people knowing their place in the data um, just made me think a bit about the kind of left to right and right to left flow differences when you're designing something for a different audience who are going in a different direction. That's one mm -hmm. thing. Then to have a place in to know the context of the where you are in the, in the data itself is another challenge. <laughs> yeah, and and some something we found interesting too is sometimes the um, the structure in which you use to navigate the the data um, with assistive technology is different than how it's visually represented. So it could look like maybe just kind of like the the network graph was a nice example where you might use like a hierarchical structure to kind of navigate through that. Yet it's actually a very flat visualization that just kind of shows how connections are connected to each other and highlights the most influential um, person in that particular network. And there's other examples like that too. Thinking about um, do you navigate through the um, visualization if it's a time series sequentially, and that might be a little bit different than than how you would see the information if you have multiple kind of charts stacked on top of one another. Um, so it, it gets really interesting, and uh, it's really important to just kind of experiment with that because it, it'll just unlock a lot of new ideas, especially um, in that assistive technology experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will ask an AI question. I know it's probably <laughs> uh, people are probably sick of AI questions at this point, but I was wondering um, if you would have, if there's anything you would approach differently, say forming this project again or is there anything that you would have been able to use that would have been helpful from using ai tools do you think 
Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I think, I think in the testing process, it could have been interesting just to kind of see how AI interpreted a data set, um, especially like early on when we were, were doing this. And I know like AI can hallucinate and stuff like that too. So you might not get the best interpretation, but just even having an understanding of how, what the capability was there and how it might approach the problem um, could unlock a few ideas of how we could craft a, an optimal screen reader experience or providing, you know, a, a text-based, like, glanceable view of, of the data. Yeah. Cool. I don't know if anyone has anyone else has any questions they'd like to add in. I'll leave with a bit more space. Um, All right, Mark, I wasn't sure, were you unmuting or was that? Sorry, yeah, my camera is a bit lopsided at the moment. Um, yeah, I have a question for Kent. Yeah. So, um, what, what do you use for prototyping? Do you do you code your stuff or do you use more designer friendly tools? Yeah, it, it kind of varies. For the, the prototypes mentioned, especially in the accessibility segment here, a lot of times we use, um, we worked with an engineering team that was building Angular components. Um, a lot of times we'll build prototypes in Vega Lite or D3. Um, just to kind of quickly get something together. So that's that's pretty useful. Um, sometimes we do, um, we'll use like observable notebooks too, just to kind of like um, enable folks who might not be as familiar with code to just kind of visually tweak some of the visualizations too and kind of understand how they work. Um, if we're looking at uh, some of the visual design examples I shared earlier, uh, then a lot of times we'll kind of use Figma, um, just kind of mock up a few ideas, especially when we're just experimenting around with focus or again, like use observable and actually use the real code to, to think about how we can um, improve that uh, experience too. And then of course, like there's a lot of uh, tools out there for uh, checking color contrast um, and stuff too. So a lot of times we'll use those along the way too, just to make sure we're keeping our, our decision-making in check and it's still compliant and whatnot. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And you could just, for the color contrast tools, you could just do a quick Google search. Um, there's a few. I like the one on WebAIM, but um, uh, there's like a, a few others that factor in like opacity and stuff too that uh, that people really like. OK. Is, is Google working on a, a data viz uh, library? Uh, well, we had the uh, Google charts. Um, a lot of times, our libraries are more internal. So you'll see them, the different libraries kind of manifested in different product areas. So. The component library that I had worked on initially um, is part of Google Cloud Platform, um, hence some of those uh, specific examples there. Uh, a lot of the testing that I had described with our working group that was actually applied to a lot of the visualizations in Google Cloud, whether it was working with folks who are colorblind or working with people who um, who use assistive technology in their their day to day lives. And again, this was all in service of transcending compliance and going that extra mile to think of how might we create um, a useful experience. OK, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I do have one question I would like to ask, actually, um, and maybe as a, as a last question. But um, a couple of situations in my past have been, obviously, people start to see the value of accessibility and, and doing things to the standard, both for financial and other reasons. <laughs> but um, it, how would you approach a, a situation where you need to retrofit um, standards to an existing product. I think it's quite a common uh, yeah. experience where you don't have things that are to standard, and, but like, wh where would you start in that kind of situation? Or yeah, I would I would start with with where the, the experience currently is. Um, take a look at like the compliance gaps, because that will highlight some of the big challenges that you'll have to overcome. And then kind of look at you know the cost benefit analysis of of starting to implement those. Like, what are going to be like the the bigger ticket items that will require more thought? What's the low hanging fruit, so to speak, that you could address very quickly? Um, I feel like in in the visual design sense, it gets pretty tricky um, because it's easy to take an existing chart, redesign it, get it up to spec, but then you take it back to your team, and it's easy for them to say, "Oh, that that looks so much worse than it did before." Uh, you know, because now everything's kind of bold for all the reasons that I that I mentioned earlier. So I think just some some good ways that you could start after kind of identifying those gaps is um, think of ways. Th look at the look at the people on the team and think of ways to help them um, gain some empathy 
uh, for folks with different conditions and different uh, disabilities. And then show them how that experience might, um, how they might experience the product too. Because I think that empathy building is, is really important for getting people on board. And then once they're on board, then start looking at the challenges of like, okay, we have these standards and these constraints. How can we start to pivot and look at them at more as opportunities? And I think once you have allies on the team and people on board, it's easier to work together, to sprint with them, do workshops, and then start to kind of knock out the different gaps on, you know, that, that you have to address and, and retrofit to your uh, previous experience. And, and some of the, some of the um, lessons learned early were when we were like doing just that. So sharing that example of, okay, we have to meet contrast requirements, but now this chart is losing focus. Oh, we can use outlines with like lighter fills, for example, to, to enable the visualization to be readable, but still now meet these, these, um, these standards that we're now striving for that we might not have earlier been. Yeah, I thought that was yeah, that was a nice a nice little trick yeah. actually with the strokes and that and the fill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Cool. Um, I would I would also throw in too if there's ever a conversation around dark mode, there's uh, a lot of I've seen designers just you know when asked why why do you have a dark theme or do you, do you prefer one or the other, I've, I've seen designers say hey dark mode just looks cool or a dark theme looks just nicer. Uh, but there's actually an accessibility benefit here too, because um, if you're trying to meet contrast requirements, um, when colors are overlaid on a darker background, you actually have a wider range of shades that are going to meet the desired contrast ratio on a dark background than you would a white background. So it's still easier to draw focus. And um, it's also good for folks um, who have like contrast sensitive vision, for example, um, to, to think about that as well. So nice. um, there might be some other tricks that could kind of map to other initiatives on a roadmap, like where folks might want to do a dark theme, but not have a good reason. And now you have a good an accessibility reason to do that. Yeah, I think we're always looking for, I personally, I'm always looking for more reasons to use dark mode or to yeah. have some more justification for it. Uh, yeah, I would, I would also say too, a lot of times um, we've had, we've had um, in the past, not, not necessarily here, but, um, uh, at other places I worked at, just ask like, "Hey, are we spending too much time on accessibility? Should you know, do people are are the only people who care about accessibility the people who need like ex like considerations for accessibility or people with disabilities?" And I I still truly think that if you think about it upfront, you can still land on a, something that's better than uh, a solution that was better than um, you would have landed on if you didn't think about it. And hopefully, some of the visual design examples kind of alluded to that, especially towards the end of that series too, or thinking about like using data sonification in, in everyday experiences and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I might say I'm getting a bit conscious of time now, uh, but I just think probably you could wrap up and say thanks very much, Ken. I'll leave the, this comment from Masha. Data viz design can be really challenging, and unfortunately, it's easy to forget about accessibility, accessibility needs while searching for data, a perfect data representation. Thank you for your invaluable insights, Kent. Uh, and yeah, totally agree with that. Thanks for your your insights and taking the time to talk to us. It's great. Awesome. Hope you all enjoyed it. Um, still feeling a little jet lagged here, so hopefully it still had the the enthusiasm came across here. Uh, but if you want to continue the discussion offline, too, please hit me up in email or social media on um, on the methods that I had shared earlier.